Thanks, Ken Corla. And at the outset, I'd like to, uh, my technical group colleague, Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan, has asked me to okay. express her apologies that unfortunately she can't be here today. But she, like myself, would welcome all initiatives that promote animal welfare and ask to record that she would look forward to the day when coursing, fur farming, fox hunting, and all such activities are uh, banned, as all of these so called uh, sports have at their core the deliberate and willful cruelty and uh, death to animals. And she made the point that um, while obviously she would like to see uh, this bill and would truly welcome the bill if it is genuinely going to tackle the issue of greyhound welfare, but there would be maybe a slight concern that uh, Board Nagan have uh, supported the legislation given uh, what has been pointed out by uh, Deputy Stanley, their um, role in the potential export of greyhounds to China, which would be an absolutely uh, appalling situation for this country to uh, be involved in. And I hope that the stalling of uh, that potential uh, activity will uh, continue and that it won't uh, actually take uh, place. I think there's no doubt uh, whatsoever that we do need um, to pay attention to the welfare of uh, greyhounds and it should be a priority for uh, the greyhound industry it actually even would make sense economically for them to do that but sadly i think the reality would contradict uh, that sentiment and originally when the lobby was enforced to exclude uh, the greyhounds from the dog breeding uh, legislation it was argued that the 1958 greyhound act was sufficient to protect and regulate and monitor uh, the welfare of of, uh, greyhounds. Now, I think we need to look at that a little bit more because throughout that period since this legislation has been uh, in place, there has been an appalling treatment of very, very many uh, greyhounds in uh, this country. And to argue that legislation on its own or that that legislation uh, protects them is absolutely belied by the uh, reality on the ground. And I just want to give uh, some examples of uh, what has taken place. I think it's fair to say that there isn't a county in Ireland that hasn't been highlighted at some stage for some uh, scandal involving the mistreatment of uh, greyhounds. In many cases throughout the country, Country, greyhounds are kept in very poor uh, conditions, confined to sheds, barns, without light, heating, proper bedding and without proper uh, care and attention. Many of them have been found uh, lying on concrete, malnourished and denied of uh, adequate care. And the reality is, is that the greyhound industry is a commercial business and the welfare of animals is secondary to that for all of those who uh, don't make uh, the grade. I think it is an indictment of Irish society that we have uh, statistics like 10,000 dogs been put down in Ireland last year, 27 dogs uh, every day, not obviously all greyhounds, but a large number of them would be unwanted by uh, breeders because they don't make the grade and are not uh, up to standard. And I think it is indicative of inadequate re um, regulation that we have so much of Britain's greyhounds being bred uh, in Ireland and uh, uh, against the background of when so many dogs uh, are being uh, put down. It's not unusual to see documented that there's been actually regular reports highlighted by uh, the media about the mistreatment of animals and indeed the misuse of uh, greyhounds incidents in um, last year, the year before in uh, Tipperary, where greyhounds uh, being a tamer breed of a dog were used as bait during the training phase of, of a fighting dog's uh, career to give the dogs uh, a taste for blood and uh, practice, if you like, in uh, fighting. Abandoned dogs with their ears uh, cut off, mutilated and found wandering the streets have happened in literally every county where greyhounds have turned up with weights around their necks, their ears um, cut off uh, and wandering around uh, abandoned, uh, obviously the ears being cut off to avoid uh, identification. Not a, that's one side of it is, is sort of wanton cruelty. Uh, but the other side, because it is a multi-million euro industry, the greyhound industry, is the whole area of the use of drugs uh, in the industry, which uh, with quite a number of dogs proving uh, testing positive uh, for drugs, drugs like um, ecstasy, uh, cocaine, 
um, Viagra and so on, which caused obviously deep uh, trauma to uh, many of uh, th those dogs. Uh, you know, when you align that with the fact of them being discarded and that um, and, and left wandering the street, it does give maybe a bit of a different picture of the sort of glowing um, references that the, the greyhound industry has been put, put out there. Um, I think we do need to look at the statistics um, in this regard and look at the amount of greyhounds that are being bred in this country, which does give you a bit of an idea about the way in which the situation is set up. Because on average, there would be about, you know, maybe 35,000 uh, pups born uh, every year out of maybe four and a half uh, thousand litters and so on. Now, you know, an average sort of year was 2007 where um, out of that, the, the 35,000 that were born, only 23,000 uh, were earmarked uh, and tattooed 16, 16 weeks later. Uh, after that, lesser number, only 20,000 20, were given uh, identity cards, making them, if you like, eligible for uh, racing uh, at that stage. So what happened to all of the other greyhounds that didn't appear on any books or didn't appear in uh, any race after that? Of course, clearly, out of those 20,000 as well, you would have a large number of when they started to race who didn't make the grade and who had to be uh, discarded at that stage because they would have been deemed to have no commercial uh, value at that stage and there has been uh, you know shocking and repeated actually and multiple cases of uh, really vicious uh, mutilations uh, taking place obviously the most popular method being uh, dogs having their ears uh, cut off to avoid uh, identification before being abandoned. Sometimes that practice has been carried out with battery acid, with um, blow torches and so on to hide the identification. As I said, being dumped in rivers, throats cut, uh, being tied down by weights. All of these things have happened in probably every county uh, in the country, some more than others, I might add. Um, under the protection of the 1958 Act. So I do think there's a warning in this situation. On the one hand, this shows us that there's a clear deficit in the legislation, uh, that what was there was certainly not enough to deal with the situation. But I also think it, it vindicates the position that legislation alone is insufficient to deal uh, with these, these questions and the whole area of enforcement um, needs to be uh, examined. Now, the legislation states, and, and I welcome the sentiment, that greyhound keepers and those involved in, in handling them shall not cause, permit, injure or cause unnecessary suffering to uh, a greyhound. And I would hope that that would be uh, a sentiment that we could uh, all agree with. But I think the problem maybe in the shortcoming in the legislation is, is that it does uh, rely largely on self-regulation, uh, where it's the greyhound industry itself which is registering uh, and in, um, monitoring the uh, new register for uh, breeding establishments and so on, uh, and that that is also under the supervision of the, the coursing club and the local authorities as well. You have a huge number of organisations involved and having a role, so the potential for a lack of clarity uh, in terms of who really is responsible and who is really going to take an overall role in this, I think is a little bit unclear uh, from the legislation. I do welcome the fact that the local authorities have a role in this situation. I, I think that is welcome. But we have to weigh that up against the massive um, reduction in resources which local authorities are operating under. So there is a contradiction in piling more responsibility onto their shoulders at the same time as we're cutting uh, resources as the recruitment ban is, is not enabling them to recoup uh, the staff that they've lost. How are they expected to take on this responsibility in uh, the serious way in which it is necessary? I actually don't see it. And my own experience from uh, the local authorities and how they deal with um, you know, stray dogs and all of that. They're absolutely stretched to the limit as it is and they can just about maintain the status quo, not to mind taking on another serious function in terms of regulating uh, the greyhound industry itself or playing a much more uh, serious role uh, in that. And I think that is something that the Minister needs to examine. I think it would be, and I'm, I'm not in favour of the recruitment embargo in the public sector anyway. I think it's, it's, it's costly and it doesn't uh, work. Um, but I think that that is something that needs to be looked at. If you're really serious about implementing and giving a role for the local authorities, then that must be a resource which does impact on uh, the recruitment embargo uh, and so on.
I think the reality is that you know a lot of the the cruelty that uh, greyhounds would experience doesn't actually happen in the kennels and I think we would accept that but rather the, a lot of the problem uh, stems from overbreeding linked to racing and then the uh, inevitable disposal of uh, the unwanted ones at that stage and I do think the whole area of problems in relation to the tracks themselves, uh, the drugs, uh, the injuries that are caused in the racing, the collisions and then what happens to those uh, animals also, the unsafe uh, running uh, surfaces and uh, so on. Now, Board Nagan, as we know, are a semi-state company uh, charged with making uh, inspections for the last 50 years or so uh, in this regard. They have the legal power already to deal with many of the issues of where welfare has been jeopardised, but they haven't implemented it, and that is a real problem. Uh, you know, for the semi-state sector, it's one I come from myself, uh, and I would, you know, normally defend them, but they have been in the, in the limelight uh, recently for the disgraceful uh, level of pay being paid to their top executives, but it's just not good enough that if this body would exist for 50 years, have these responsibilities, and the litany of abuses which I've outlined and are well documented and uh, indexed would be taking place uh, under uh, their watch. So I think a crucial part that the Minister needs to uh, address is that while the legislation that's there is fine, although there is a little bit of, a, I'd have to say, a, a lack of clarity about who actually is going to take overall responsibility for running it, but the idea that the legislation uh, alone is going to be a panacea, I don't think anybody would believe that that is the case, and if the sentiments uh, to improve the welfare are going to be addressed, well then it has to be backed up with their uh, resources, and particularly at local authority level. I think one of the very good uh, examples of where that took place was, was the situation with the uh, limelight being much more drawn now on the issue of the, the Smithfield horse market, that since that uh, a much more tighter enforcement has gone on in that regard. We have seen the results of that, with uh, less uh, horses being traded uh, in, in uh, that regard and more um, proactive um, responses uh, being made in, in, uh, in uh, that way. So, I mean, in an overall sense, I think measures like restricting the litters, you know, trying to professionalise more uh, the registration are welcome. But uh, I think there needs to be more, and I think there needs to be more in the context of overall animal welfare issues as well. There is a view amongst many in society who care deeply uh, about these issues that maybe this government is trying to water back on some previous commitments given uh, with regard to improving our standing in that uh, regard, with regard to um, fur farming. Uh, with regard, there was the threat, obviously, to, to reverse the um, ban on, on stag hunting and so on. And I think, as other deputies have said, is this is an issue which a lot of people feel very, very strongly about and do want uh, animal welfare addressed in a serious way. It's often put about, and you can understand it on a level, uh, that people say, look at the state of this country. Uh, it's in tatters internationally. Uh, we are, you know, <laughs> we are like Greece, despite what the government uh, would tell us. And we're in a very, very precarious situation where many of our uh, citizens are obviously suffering uh, horrendous uh, problems and in that context the view will be put about why are people even wasting their time talking about animal welfare issues when you have such vast problems affecting uh, humans and of course you know the, the, the reality is that um, the two aren't contradictory. All of those issues need to be addressed and should be addressed, but I do think that the animal welfare issues are long overdue. In some ways, they are legacy issues uh, which should have been uh, addressed previously, and whether we are economically successful or economically going through a recession or a, a depression is, is actually no justification to tolerate uh, cruelty and willful neglect of animals uh, or anybody, uh, anybody else, because as, as uh, previously Previous deputies have said a, a civilised society is judged by uh, the way in which it uh, treats its most uh, vulnerable uh, citizens primarily and I think there's a correlation actually between the way this government is targeting uh, the most uh, vulnerable citizens and then maybe uh, as well how there may be a certain rowing back on some animal welfare issues and uh, certainly on uh, this side of the house we won't be allowing that to happen. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, the next